I started the Pure Package um, because I thought it was a service that I would really want. The idea of eating wonderful food guilt-free was perfect. So the idea of having a team of nutritional and dietary therapists work out exactly what I should be eating and then a team of chefs cook it all for me and deliver it each day was just a dream. Um, and nobody else was doing it. Um, and the idea of being a pioneer and revolutionising sort of the diet industry in this country appealed to me. First of all, I decided to ask my friends if they'd taste the food for me and tell me what they thought. And my friends were really lovely people, which pretty much makes them useless um, as you know, giving it proper feedback because they just say, oh, Jenny, those muffins were delicious. Send me some more muffins, which isn't very helpful at all. So I decided to get in contact with the most opinionated people around. Um, so I'd read a newspaper or a, or a magazine, um, something written by a journalist, and I'd think this person actually knows what they're talking about. And so I would make contact with that journalist and say, hey, do you want to try some of my food? I'm not going to charge you. I'm not expecting any pieces out of it. But you've got to fill in a bit of a survey. And these poor, unfortunate journalists had to fill in like nine page surveys. And I'm not exaggerating. They really did have to fill them in. They had to tell me everything that they thought from the knives and forks to the pricing. And they got back to me. And a few of them actually wrote pieces as well. And so from that, um, we had a full page in the Evening Standard um, a couple of days after I launched. Well, pro I think the the day or the day after I launched. Um, and from that, the phones just rang off the hook. I was too nervous to go to any banks and borrow money. And I also didn't fancy the idea of standing up in front of a group of venture capitalists and selling myself and selling the business. Um, I knew that they would ask really reasonable questions like, what do you expect your sales to be? And I'd have to make up the answers because I didn't really know. It was a completely new concept, um, so I didn't know what was going to happen. So I was way too nervous to ask anybody for money. Um, and that has meant that I've built up the company without borrowing any money from any banks and without getting anybody else involved, so there's no other investors. I realised that from a cash flow point of view, it made a lot of sense because I was able to ask my clients to pay me in advance and it was a perfectly reasonable thing to do. So at the beginning, my clients paid me for 10 days food in advance, and when, which was about £300. And when I decided that I needed to move the business out of the house, I looked at my pricing structure and I thought, I'll offer people... And you have to remember, these people were often on a wait list before they even got on. So I said, I will offer you 90 days food at a slightly discounted price, but you obviously have to pay me now. Um, and also I did one for 30 days food as well. And so instead of getting £300 from each client, I got closer to £3,000 from each client. So all those £3,000 added up. And that's how I was able to take on a premises and a huge oven, which you could fit five men into, and um, was able to take that, that big step. When I first started um, and I was looking for people to supply to me, people just didn't take me seriously. Um, originally, I, would have, I wanted to um, outsource my kitchens and outsource everything, and it became really apparent right from the beginning that people just didn't take me or my concepts seriously. Um, and my first you know, main supplier was Tesco.com. Um, they would deliver the food to me or I'd go to the supermarket because I was, I was cooking for a few people in my house. That's how it started, literally from the kitchen sink. What I do to, to get my work-life balance right is the days I decide, right, I'm working certain days and I'm not working other days. And the days that I'm actually working, I work proper days. So I start work at 5.20 in the morning, well, jump out of bed at 5.20 in the morning and pretty much start work immediately and then make sure I have work dinners and everything. So I literally do a good old 14 hour day on the days that I'm working. And I do that two to three days a week. So my family and my kids actually get the bulk of me. So those other four days that are left out of the seven day week, I am theirs. 
So what happened to me was I was attacked by this man, horrible man, who broke my leg and broke my finger. And I was six months pregnant at the time. And it meant that I became totally housebound and was too scared to go out. And it was really, really awful. But it meant I actually delegated. And a lot of small businesses have, you know, it's this big step for the entrepreneur to take that step back. And so I had this sort of quite dramatic step back from the business um, where I let my team get on with their jobs and they stepped up to it. And I haven't looked back since because it's meant that I've been able to take a much more strategic role and push the company forward um, instead of still being roted on. Because I used to, at the beginning, do all the driving. I used to do pretty much all the cooking, answer the phones. So do everything. And it's meant that I really let my team do their jobs. Things that I would have done differently, I think one of the main things is at the very beginning, I suppose I was quite innocent. People would come along and they'd say, oh yeah, sure, I'll help you with that. And you'd, oh, fantastic. And then six months later, you'd get this whopping great bill. And you'd think, I didn't realise I was, I didn't realise that that, that that was the agreement. So I think... I've got quite good now at covering myself in emails, even if it's not an actual sort of legal document, so that we both remember what happened. At the beginning, I had things like, you know, a set of an accountants who sent me a huge bill, and I thought that I was just visiting them to talk about potentially taking them as accountants. I didn't realise that it was an actual meeting that I was going to be paying £200 an hour for. So all of these things, you really can be very expensive at the beginning. And, and when you first start and you spend two hours sitting with an accountant at £200 an hour and you get a bill for £400 plus VAT, which is nearly £500, it's quite shocking. So I think that's what I learned was to make sure, to, to realise that you're in a business relationship with people and treat it as such. In order to stay motivated by your business, it has to be something that you believe in because lots of hurdles come along that mean that you would you know, stop and give up. That's why so many businesses close down. So if you're running a business that has ethics and is good and is something you really believe in, then you're going to jump those hurdles and you're going to keep on trucking and you're going to do really well. But if you're running a business that you're not really proud of and, and doesn't follow your personal ethics, then... You're never going to be able to jump the hurdles in the same way that someone who's doing something that is making the world a better place does. I truly believe that I'm making the world a better place by having my company. I'm improving people's qualities of lives um, and I'm, not, I'm making a profit and I'm not scarring anybody in the process. I love what I do and I really enjoy the pure package, but it's always a good idea to have a plan of how you would get out of your company if you wanted to. Um, it's responsible to, your, to the people that work for you and, and your clients because you never know what could happen to you. And you never know how circumstances are going to change. And actually, I think the, the criteria that somebody else would be looking for in your company if they were to buy it are also the criteria that you should be including in your business plan in the first place. So you should be thinking about your exit plan, not necessarily as an exit plan, but really as, as a forward-thinking strategy.